Well, welcome everyone to our 14th seminar of the Aphasia CRE seminar series. I'm Caroline Baker, co-facilitator of the seminar series. La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We pay our respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining us online today. We warmly welcome you to this very special seminar, the second one in the series to cross international borders. Today we cross to the UK from Australia while gathering many attendees locally and internationally um, for Professor Katerina Hillary's presentation, Supporting Wellbeing Through Peer Befriending, Results from the Superb Feasibility Randomised Control Trial. We were due to have Katerina join us as an Aphasia CRE International Visiting Scholar, but unfortunately due to COVID, this visit will need to be rescheduled we acknowledge the difficult time of COVID-19 for everyone around the world. We are particularly thinking of healthcare staff who continue to provide support to individuals and communities during this challenging time. We are so delighted that Professor Hillary is still able to provide her talk via this webinar today. Before the formal introduction, let's briefly cover some housekeeping. Please be patient with the technology today and our apologies in advance if you experience any disruptions to your view viewing during the seminar. Occasionally attendees join late. Um, to enhance everyone's Zoom experience, please ensure that your microphone and video remain turned off for the duration of the presentation. Please also minimise your Zoom gallery so you can view the slides as best as possible. Thank you. This seminar is being recorded on Zoom and will be available to access along with past webinar videos via the website. Just click on the resources tab. Videos are usually uploaded one to two weeks after the seminar. A reminder that the CRE has, a de has developed a repository of aphasia-friendly COVID-19 resources. These have been sourced from across the world and you are welcome to use these resources in your practice. Uh, questions for today's seminar will be aided by the use of Slido. You can log in anonymously or with your name and ask a question at any time. Our code for Slido is aphasia CRE. Enter your question under the questions tab uh, at any time throughout this presentation and you will also be able to see questions asked by other audience members. Like a question by clicking on the thumbs up to show those of most interest to the group. It's a great way to engage with the presentation experience um, and Professor Hillary will answer as many questions as time will allow at the end of the presentation. At the end of the presentation you are also welcome to offer any suggestions for future seminar topics. And engage with us today on social media. Um, we use Twitter and Facebook and feel free to tweet along today and use the hashtag aphasiacre. And if you haven't already done so, please join us as a member of the community of practice. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers and organisations to join. Our benefits to members include um, a regular newsletter, updates about events and activities, contributions to research and networking opportunities. The CRE is always looking for financial support and if you wish to do donate, please see our website for details. So now I'm absolutely delighted to formally introduce to you Professor Katerina Hillary. Katerina is a Professor of Acquired Communication Disorders and 
at the research centre and research centre joint lead at City University of London. She's a speech and language therapist with a background in psychology. Her research is driven by the priorities of people with aphasia and focuses on the impact of aphasia on people's lives and ways to assess this impact and address it in rehabilitation. Katerina leads the Trials for Aphasia panel of the Collaboration of Aphasia Trialists and is on the board of trustees of Aphasia Reconnect. Thank you so much, Katerina. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'm just going to start um, sharing my um, slides. Okay, so thank you for this um, wonderful introduction. Um, uh, I'm, I was going to be, as you said, in, in Australia visiting you all and, and, and seeing a bit of your beautiful um, country. Um, and I was really looking forward to it, but I'm stuck here in London, in, in rainy um, London today. Um, so at least I can connect with you online. So thank you so much for um, inviting me to talk to you uh, in the Aphasia series, uh, seminar series. So here I've included a picture of, of our team here at City. Um, you may recognize some faces uh, and some of the um, research assistants uh, in the study are in this picture, Becky Moss, Katie Monoli, Abby Roper. Um, some of the key people though uh, in the team like um, uh, Dr. Sarah Northcott and Dr. Nicholas Penn are not in this picture, uh, although they had a very big um, contribution uh, in, in Superb. But I thought I'll, I'll include this picture just to give you a sense of the, of the lovely team that I'm very lucky to be um, a member of here at City. So, oh, my slides are not progressing, there we go, okay. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about the supporting will be through peer befriending feasibility trial. I'm going to start with uh, the need for the study, then I'm going to go over the, the aims and design of the study. <clears throat> I'm going to describe our intervention, our peer befriending scheme for you, and I'm going to concentrate on the feasibility, acceptability and clinical outcomes. So I'm going to give you the results in these uh, areas. And then right at the end, I'm going to um, talk about the project that we are currently running, which is looking at uh, delivering our peer befriending intervention uh, remotely via Zoom. So first, I would like to acknowledge uh, our team. Um, we have a large team of speech and language therapists uh, from uh, City. We also have mental health nurses, a health economist, uh, a health psychologist and statisticians in the team from different universities in the UK. And um, I would like to uh, especially acknowledge um, Dr. Nicholas Bett, who was the trial manager in the study and um, he, he was really instrumental in the success of the whole project. I would also like to acknowledge our funders. Uh, the, stroke <clears throat> the Stroke Association here in the UK. I've been drinking plenty of water, but still voice breaks at some times. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the, the people with aphasia who took part in the study, but also the different groups of people with aphasia um, who influenced the focus of the study and how we, we run the study. And these are our consultants with aphasia, a uh, group of befrienders that deliver the intervention and our user group. Okay, so coming on to the need for the study. Depression is a big problem after stroke. And it's very common. So it's estimated that um, between 25 and 79% of people with stroke will suffer from depression at some point. And in a, in a systematic review and meta-analysis that has actually recently been um, um, uh, updated. About a third of stroke survivors will suffer from depression at some time uh, after stroke. For those with aphasia, depression is even more of a problem. And uh, in one study by Kauhan and et al, at three months after stroke, 70% uh, of people with aphasia were depressed. And this remained high at 62% uh, a year after the stroke. And in fact, the incidence of major depression um, increased in this time frame. In one of our own studies, we um, followed a, a cohort of people with stroke from the time they had the stroke. 
uh, to three months and six months later. And when we compared people with aphasia to those without, the vast majority of people with aphasia had high psychological distress compared to about half of those without aphasia. And then we also looked at what predicts um, depression later on at six months. And uh, in terms of what factors at baseline predict who will have psychological distress, high psychological distress later on, the strongest predictors were distress at baseline, loneliness and low satisfaction with social network. So depression is very common after stroke and depression matters. It, um, it affects rehabilitation outcomes, it reduces the long-term um, benefit that people can gain, and it even leads to higher mortality rates. And depression is also persistent. So not only do we need interventions that um, help people who are depressed cope better, we also need interventions that promote well-being and adjustment and may prevent depression from occurring in the first place. And in our study, we're looking in one such intervention. We're looking at a level one intervention in terms of the step care model for psychological care after stroke. I'm very aware this is a very busy slide, but what it maps, it maps um, level of need and, and severity of depression to the services that people get. So right at the bottom of the pyramid at level one, we have interventions that are appropriate for all clients, regardless of whether they have um, depression or low mood or not. Um, and then as we progress up the pyramid, um, the, the interventions are more targeted. So they are for people who have depression and then at levels three and four for people with severe depression. And there they need uh, more specialist therapies and more specialist service provision. But at level one, we have various interventions. You see this on the left hand side, uh, support groups, befriending, uh, art, leisure therapy, motivational interviewing, uh, the ask intervention that um, is uh, is I think is being completed in in Australia at the moment the the, the trial on it and and generally um, a, a range of different interventions that may support people and potentially uh, prevent depression from happening and from these interventions in our trial we chose the peer befriending. Um, because peer befriending um, has this unique feature that it can lead to benefits not only uh, for people receiving the intervention, but also for the people providing the intervention. So I'm going to come on to the aims and design of the study. And I just want to say that we've published the protocol of the trial, which includes full detail of uh, our methods and, and our trial in pilot and feasibility studies. And this is an open access publication. So Superbix is a mixed methods uh, feasibility randomized control trial, and it has multiple aims. Today, I'm going to focus on the uh, results on the acceptability of the study design and the intervention and the feasibility of recruitment and retention uh, to the trial and to a future uh, definitive trial. And I'm also going to present to you the results of psychological and social um, outcomes that we're using for our participants and sort of reflect a little bit on which of them may be good, good outcomes for a definitive trial. So who are our participants? Our, Participants with aphasia are people with low levels of distress, and we screen these with the discs um, in order to make sure that people who obviously have higher needs get more specialist support. As we said, this is a level one intervention, so we're looking for people with aphasia at low levels of distress. And we also um, recruit the significant others if they're willing to participate. And 10 befrienders with aphasia who are people with aphasia who are longer post stroke and they have mild uh, or moderate uh, aphasia. The study is a single blind multi methods uh, parallel group RCT, and we are comparing usual care plus peer befriending versus usual care control. Um, our recruitment, we had to extend our recruitment period from 12 to 18 months uh, to meet our recruitment targets. And um, initially we were recruiting from uh, three London boroughs that also represent variability in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds of the people and five main uh, hospitals here in the UK. But we broadened our recruitment to include um, community services um, and, and maximize um, the, the referrals we were getting. Superb had multiple work packages. Um, we had a development phase, the randomized control trial. We also have a qualitative study. Um, we are analyzing in-depth interviews, uh, 50 in-depth interviews. Um, 
we had people with aphasia taking part in the qualitative study from both arms of the study, um, significant others and peer befriender. And also the people with aphasia from the intervention arm, we also interviewed them uh, at four months and at 10 months. So um, at both time points. And we had an economic evaluation. But today I'm focusing on the findings of our randomized controlled trial where we aim to recruit about 60 people with aphasia and their significant others and 10 peer befrienders. And we assess them um, at baseline, which was uh, around the randomization time, and then four months later and 10 months later. And four months was the time that uh, those receiving the um, intervention, the peer befriending, would be just after completing the intervention. Okay, so what are feasibility outcomes? Um, we're using um, a range of metrics that inform recruitment and retention to the trial. So we're looking at rate of eligibility per month, rate of consent per month. Um, we're also looking at how many people of those that are screened are eligible, how many people consent, and how many people complete the study, so how many withdrawals we have. In terms of acceptability, we're looking at um, indications of acceptability of our study procedures and outcome measures. So do people complete the study and all the outcome measures? Also, in terms of acceptability of intervention, do people complete the intervention as intended? And we also use uh, data from our qualitative interviews um, to see what people thought about the study and our processes and the intervention. In terms of clinical outcomes, we have a broad range of uh, outcome measures we are using. Uh, in fact, we're using more measures than we would intend to do to, uh, in a definitive trial because we're, we're looking at how the measures are um, working. Our intended primary measure is the general health questionnaire, the 12 item version, which is an emotional distress scale. The scores on the GHQ range from zero to 12 and high scores mean low distress, where, uh, sorry, Low scores mean low distress and high scores mean uh, high distress. And we also use the GHQ12 as a categorical variable uh, as a secondary outcome measure. Um, GHQ is used as a screening tool for depression. So it has a cutoff. If people um, score between zero, one and two, we consider them as having low or um, no distress. Whereas if they score three and above, they have high distress and they may be um, depressed. Other secondary outcomes were the communication participation item bank, the short um, well-being, um, Warwick and Andy environmental well-being scale. We also use the community integration uh, questionnaire, uh, the friendship scale and the communication confidence um, rating scale for aphasia. For our significant others, we had measures of well-being, emotional distress and carrier burden. And for the peer befrienders, well-being, community integration, and self-efficacy. For our peer befrienders, we also use the GHQ12 as a safety measure. So we look to see whether uh, during um, befriending and delivering the intervention, whether the distress uh, increased. Because obviously they're coming in contact with people uh, who may be uh, distressed themselves and they have to support them. So we made sure we monitored their um, levels of, of um, psychological distress to ensure that they are well throughout the study. Our intervention has been described in detail in the paper I mentioned earlier. We, we have a tidy checklist that um, includes all the details of the um, intervention. It's based on the CONNECT peer befriending scheme, now aphasia reconnect. And um, a key difference from, uh, from uh, the, the CONNECT befriending scheme is that we offer it at the time that we think it's a very high need for, for people. So it's when they're discharged home from hospital and when active therapies are withdrawn. So that's the time where people sort of, you know, they go back home from hospital, typical here in the UK, a lot of people get about six weeks of early supported discharge. And then gradually the therapies are withdrawn and they are left with their aphasia, um, to face the, 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 the future. And, and that's the time where we decided that it's the right time for us to start with uh, peer befriending. So our befriendings uh, uh, visit people with aphasia six times over a period of uh, four months. And then we also have um, an option to visit, uh, to visit during the next six months, just for a smoother transition to the end of um, befriending. Um, 
obviously the people delivering the intervention in our study are people with aphasia so we have a very thorough training uh, program and um, uh, an ongoing and regular supervision system uh, our training uh, was delivered over two three days uh, our befrienders were split uh, in smaller groups so uh, twos and threes and some of them got the training in two days some on three days depending on their needs um, and they also received a handbook um, that they could refer to throughout the training, but also had resources for them to use uh, during the intervention. And in the training, we covered what befriending is all about, what are the roles of the befriender and the befriendee, um, um, how to manage conversations, uh, how to talk about um, emotional issues, uh, how to manage uh, difficult incidents and perhaps adverse events, and health and safety, obviously. And their unbefrienders had very regular supervision. They had the monthly group supervision with the other befrienders. Um, and they also had additional one-to-one uh, -one support uh, in the format they needed it, answer when needed. Okay, so what is befriending? Befriending is um, social and emotional support that is provided by people who have experience of a condition. So in our case, people with aphasia. And they aim to bring um, positive changes, so social and personal change, to their befriendee. Um, a unique feature of befriending is that the people who deliver it have experience of, of what the befriendee is going through. So they can offer genuine empathy, uh, as well as acceptance, respect and support. Um, and they can offer hope uh, and they can also share their own experiences and ideas about what to do to help uh, and how to cope. And peer befriending has not been, one-to-one -one peer befriending has not been systematically evaluated before um, in, uh, in aphasia or indeed um, in stroke in the way we do it. Um, but evidence from uh, a systematic literature review and meta-analysis in other conditions has shown positive um, effects, significant positive effects, uh, especially in terms of reducing depressive symptoms. So in our scheme, each befriender is matched with a person with aphasia. And um, in terms of the criteria we use for matching, uh, a key, uh, you know, a key de deciding factor is geography. Obviously, our befrienders have to go and visit um, people with aphasia at home. So the people with aphasia need to be in, um, in the locality. They need to be able to travel to get there. So befrienders were based within their boroughs and they saw people in their boroughs. Um, we take into account practical considerations like smoking or whether there are pets in the house. And um, our befrienders uh, fill out um, um, a matching questionnaire and the befrienders as well. And they also, um, we ask them about the personal interest and whether they have a, a preferences in terms of who they are matched in terms of the personal interest, cultural factors uh, and demographic variables like gender and age. But we actually found that demographic variables were not that important as the other um, variables. So in the first meeting, obviously, the, um, the two people with aphasia have to meet each other and establish rapport, and they also have to, to talk about practicalities, the frequency, the schedule um, of the visits, and what they're going to do. Um, I'll be friends, sort of, we'll ask the people with aphasia whether they have any goals, any particular concerns they want to discuss, and they will take this into account in subsequent visits. And subsequent visits typically include a lot of conversation, uh, problem solving, but also they may include um, activities that they do um, together or even um, a trip out to a local group or a local cafe. Okay, so coming to the, to, the, to the outcomes, to the results of the study, and I'm going to start with the feasibility and acceptability outcomes. First of all, in terms of the participants we recruited, we aim to recruit um, 60 participants. We recruited 62 participants, but we randomized um, 56. So we lost some uh, participants. And this is because, as I said earlier, we recruited primarily from um, hospitals. And, but actually our interventions kicked in much later when people were at home in the community and um, uh, therapies were uh, withdrawn. So yeah, some people then changed their mind in this um, time frame. In terms of um, how well balanced uh, our groups were, they were well balanced. We had 28 uh, participants in each group and um, they were very well balanced in terms of aphasia severity, mobility, um, gender and age and also other um, uh, participant characteristics, but I've included the summary only here. 
We were also quite pleased that about a quarter of all our participants had severe, or very severe aphasia. So we were really interested to see how the scheme can work with people with, um, uh, with more severe problems. We had 48 significant others taking part in the study. Um, not all the participants had a significant other and not all the significant others consented, obviously. Um, about uh, over a third of them were partners or spouses of the person with aphasia. The next biggest group were children uh, and we had other relatives and friends as well. And the majority of our significant others were uh, women and we had 10 befrienders, eight of whom were um, women. Okay, so um, just to say that in the results, I'm using a traffic light system. Um, just to highlight in summary whether um, what we're seeing on the slide is positive in terms of progressing to the definitive trial, or perhaps uh, you know, there are considerations and challenges we need to address. So in terms of feasibility, typically in a randomized controlled trial, when we um, start presenting the results, we have what we call a console diagram, which shows the participant flow in the study. And typically, console diagrams start with um, how many people were screened and how many people of those screened were eligible. But for, for those of you um, listening to me who are researchers and are considering taking a randomized control trial, I thought I'll start a console diagram a step um, higher, a step earlier. So here you see that we actually identified 738 people as potential participants in the study. But um, about 650 of them um, were excluded even before they reached uh, full screening. There were good reasons for that. And for us, a main reason was um, they were out of area or they moved out of area, so the befrienders couldn't visit them. So over 200 people moved out of area. And um, the other uh, major factor were, were, was having other health problems. So either other um, uh, significant cognition and mental health uh, diagnoses or comorbidities that made them um, frail and unable to take part in the study. So we screened 89 people um, fully to take part in the study. And I'm putting this up just to highlight um, the amount of work and, and, uh, that is required in order to, to identify um, participants and recruit participants in an, in an RCT, and also how many people we lose for various reasons. Our study didn't have any extensive um, exclusion criteria. We were quite um, open in terms of um, you know, recruiting people uh, in the study. And still, you know, we, recruited, we, we, we screened 89 people in a period of, of um, 18 months from five different hospitals and community uh, services. Now, looking at uh, the typical feasibility parameters, our study performs really well. If we look at rates, rates are a little slower than we would like. Um, uh, for example, we consented uh, 3.4 participants per month. And again, this is from five different hospitals, as I said. Uh, but if we look at um, proportions, if we look at proportion eligible of those screened, it's quite high at 84%. And proportion who consent of those eligible, high at almost 83%. And we also didn't lose many people in the study. Uh, as I said earlier, six people uh, withdrew before they were actually um, uh, randomized to take part in the trial. Uh, but once people were randomized, uh, we only lost uh, four participants. Coming on to our acceptability outcomes. In terms of proportion who completed the study and the outcome measures, um, 52 of the 56 people with aphasia completed the study and all the outcome measures. Uh, as I said, we only lost four people and three of them unfortunately passed away. Only one person withdrew. Of the significant others, 40 out of 48 completed the study and all our peer befrienders completed the study and all the outcome measures. If we look at uh, those who received the interventions and whether they completed um, all the sessions as intended, Almost 81% completed the six sessions and almost 93% completed at least two sessions. So this is high uh, adherence to the intervention. And looking at qualitative data, I'm not going to do a qualitative data any justice. I'm going very briefly to, to give some key uh, findings. Overall, in the interview, uh, participants found the logistics of the study straightforward. Um, the outcome measures were acceptable. 
um, we had some sensitive assessments on mood um, and uh, some people, you know, uh, a couple of people did get um, distressed during an assessment or uh, we had one significant other, uh, was significant other worrying about uh, the participant with aphasia answering uh, the questions on the questionnaire. But overall, people were quite happy to, to complete these measures and, 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 and say how they're feeling and how they're doing. And of the people with aphasia who took part to the interventions, uh, to the intervention, the majority would recommend the intervention to, to others. <clears throat> Coming on to our clinical outcomes, the more, um, I think the more uh, exciting and interesting bit of the presentation. So I'm very, very aware that this is a very busy slide and I'm going to talk you through it. So on the left hand side, you see our different outcome measures starting with the primary outcome, the GHQ-12, and then our uh, different um, secondary outcomes. So um, what this slide shows is the difference between the intervention of the control arm at four months and the difference at 10 months. So this is the difference in mean scores and the associated confidence intervals. Um, the first thing to say is that our study is a feasibility study, so it wasn't powered to uh, detect um, important and significant differences between uh, the groups. Um, but we do get some effects. Uh, generally, the effects are small and the confidence intervals uh, cross uh, zero. So here we have uh, one measure that favours the control arm, and that's the community integration questionnaire. We have some measures that are uh, uh, are color coded in black here where the differences are very small there is no effect one way or the other and the primary outcome measure and some of the other secondary um, outcome measures favor the intervention and they're colored in um, green. Um, if we look at the four months data in a different way so here I'm going to show you standardized effect sizes and um, these are expressed in standard deviations from the mean. So what they do, the reason I'm showing this is that they make all the measures comparable. So we're not actually looking at the actual scores on the measures, we're looked at um, putting these scores on the same scale. And we've got a graph here and the line uh, of zero means there is no difference between control and intervention arm. The, uh, the means of the two groups are very near the, the the zero line. And as we move away from the, the line, we have um, you know, small moving towards uh, moderate and larger effect sizes. So um, where you see um, the, the, the dots and the triangles represent the mean difference. And where there is a triangle, a negative um, difference would be um, positive for the intervention. So a lower score would mean that people are doing better. It's like our distress score, when it goes down, people are doing better. So all the, the triangles, we would expect them to be below the line and the circles above the line to see an effect, a positive effect for the um, intervention. And as you see, generally they're close to zero, but um, the primary outcome is in the right direction, um, though the confidence intervals are crossing zero. Now, if we look at the uh, GHQ as a, um, uh, as a um, categorical variable in terms of splitting people in groups of no or low distress or high distress and potentially depression, we see that our two groups, the peer group and the usual, arm, uh, usual care group, um, were quite well balanced at baseline. So 57% uh, of those in the usual care arm and 54% of those in the peer befriending arm um, scored within the depressed uh, range. But if we look at uh, four months, 40% in the usual arm versus 30% in the peer arm scored in the depressed range. So there seemed to be a positive uh, change there. If we look at the same um, data 10 months, uh, the same picture more or less emerges. Uh, some differences are clearer now. So our primary outcome, uh, the confidence intervals just close zero. The effect is a little larger in terms of positive effect uh, for those that receive the intervention. And also the communication participation item bank uh, works pretty well uh, for a feasibility trial. This is a pretty um, nice uh, outcome and effect size. And again, if we look at the um, categorical GHQ, um, as I said, people were well balanced at baseline. And when we look at 10 months, 11% of those in the peer arm scored within the depressed range versus 40% uh, in the usual care arm. This represents an 88% decrease in the odds of caseness 
uh, on the GHQ uh, 12. So it's a very big difference. In fact, our statisticians were uh, very um, reluctant to share these findings with us when they emerged because they thought that there may be something um, wrong and they wanted to check that all the data were um, correct and they were correct and this is a true finding this is what we found uh, it's it's a big difference and um, uh, it's it's a very positive finding for the intervention but we need to bear in mind that this is a feasibility trial and it may be um, a chance uh, finding because our study is uh, the numbers uh, of participants in groups are small but if it is a true finding it's a very uh, positive finding for peer befriending. Um, just to give you a flavor from a qualitative uh, data in terms of what the, um, those receiving the intervention said, they had, um, uh, they, they commented on the people with aphasia, of their befriending being a person with aphasia. This was important to them. Um, Samson here says, I discuss her predicament also in the same situation. I'm not on my own. I'm not the only person who is suffering this. So I take some sort of confidence in that. And Marilyn, uh, also um, at four months after stroke, says, also for me to see somebody who's living proof of somebody who's had a very bad stroke and is still surviving, I think she's somebody you would admire. So here we see that um, um, it's important for people with aphasia that the befriender is, is uh, somebody who has had aphasia and it's, it's further down the journey uh, than they are. They can see how people can do further down the line. Um, also, uh, the befriendees um, compared themselves to the person with aphasia uh, that was befriending them, compared themselves to the befriender, and sometimes this makes them feel very positive about themselves. Ivy here at 10 months says, to me, I'm better off than him. I have more family, but he's happy even though he walks with a stick. When I was sick, I didn't realize I was better off than some. So I was disturbed until I saw him. Then I said, oh, I'm blessed. And also they talked about um, perhaps being occupied and, and feeling less um, isolated. It makes me think more when I'm lonely. But if somebody's there, I'm re-engaged in conversation. Makes me forget about how I cannot do things when I become more remorse. At least you're occupied with something. Therefore, you don't sit idle for you to ponder other things. If we look at clinical outcomes for significant others and peer befrienders, um, for a significant others, there was no evidence of benefit but also no evidence of increased uh, burden. And these are positive outcomes in the feasibility uh, trial. First, we need to remember that the intervention was not targeted on the significant others. The intervention was only targeted on the uh, person with aphasia. And the person with aphasia only had six sessions in a period of four months or perhaps an additional couple uh, in the next six months. Um, so we can't, it's, it's difficult to expect any, any uh, uh, substantial gains for the for the significant others and in terms of our befrienders uh, a very small group only 10 peer befrienders we had there was no evidence of benefit on the clinical outcomes and also we saw an increase in the scores on the GHQ 12 that um, we were using as a safety measure so the mean score went from 0 0.8 to 2 um, and um, the positive thing is that it still remained uh, in, in the low distress uh, range for the group of uh, befrienders. If we look at what people, um, what the befrienders said uh, in the qualitative interviews, I have included some quotes here just to, um, uh, to show to you what they talk about. Um, um, before the quotes, I have some sort of um, uh, information. They talked about challenges. The logistics were um, demanding. Um, peer befrienders had to negotiate the, the, the journey, they had to travel by tube or bus to get to the home of the befriendee and arrive there in time, they had to schedule appointments, and this was hard. They also had to manage the communication environment, they talked about the TV playing in the background, 
and whether they should do something to deal with that or not. We also had a couple of befrienders uh, visiting people in nursing homes and one of them uh, was saying in the interviews that uh, one time there was uh, a choir going on in the background, another time there was building work, so it was hard to manage this. There was also no privacy um, in the nursing home. Uh, they had unexpected incidents to, to deal with and also they had to witness the distress of the different D and this was hard. And um, one of the hardest thing probably was the cancelled visits. Um, uh, I specifically remember one uh, peer befriender saying that she was standing there in the rain, she had managed to get there and she rang the bell and there was nobody at home uh, and she had let the befriendy know but you know they didn't cancel the visit. So this, this can be quite demoralizing. Um, and we also had one participant who was uh, not very well during the, um, the uh, intervention, um, not, not in terms of his physical health, but um, he had uh, some memory problems and he fatigued easily. So there were times that he would fall asleep during uh, the befriending. And this was uh, hard for the, uh, for the befriender, but they relied on, on, um, on the regular supervision and support to manage these challenges. They also made a lot of positive reflections. Um, they found their role enjoyable and rewarding. They felt they were making a positive difference in someone else's life and this was really important to them. Um, befriending was like a secure challenge for them that enabled them to reconnect with the pre-stroke identity. And throughout the interviews, there was a strong belief that they have something very unique to offer, that people with aphasia can offer unique support because they can relate to their emotions and the difficulties that people are experiencing and offer practical suggestions. And I've included some quotes to, to highlight these points. So in terms of, of um, reconnecting with pre-stroke identity, Karen here says, I think enjoyed the training because training reminded me of going to work. It made me feel more like you're normal because I'm not working anymore. So getting up and going to training was really exciting. And then, um, Kobe here had um, a different D who didn't want to go out of the house uh, and Kobe encouraged her to go out of the house. And then he says in another befriending visit, she was telling me that, oh, I went out this morning. I went to the park here this morning. This changing, yeah. It makes me feel excited, really happy. But yeah, at least somebody takes your advice for once. And then he also reflected that for him, this was really useful. At least you're helping people. So it was really important to help others. And Joyce here says, when you talk to someone that's had one, they talk about word more about just stroke, how they feel, which no one does. So this person, so this means quite a lot to that person. So Joyce here is talking about the fact that between them, the befriendee and the befriender talk about emotions, they talk about things that they may not raise with other people, and this is again important. Um, Joyce here uh, talks about benefits uh, for herself and the importance of supervision. I love it because also it benefits me. Um, it's a bit of a challenge, open the door and see who it is. I know I've got someone behind me. I feel secure in that way. So supervision was quite important. The support they got from the supervisor uh, was really, really indispensable in terms of um, delivering their peer befriending. And also the fact that they knew they don't have to wait for the group support. If they needed somebody, they could, they could ring or they contact the, uh, the supervisor and he would support them. She would support them actually. And I love this quote from Zainab, who was very positive uh, about um, the overall scheme. The best thing is that I like happy and they satisfied with me that I've been there. They feel good about themselves, and I feel good about myself. Yeah, that's the best thing. Okay, so um, now we're in the process of uh, running a little project um, where we're testing um, uh, remote delivery of the peer befriending, obviously in the context of um, COVID-19, but something that can be very useful in general in the future. So um, we have eight people with aphasia helping us. We have four that we've trained as peer befrienders and four that uh, received the peer befriending intervention. 
and in terms of our training we adjusted the training so uh, our training covered remote delivery and managing the technology managing our chosen platform zoom but also online health and safety issues and we delivered the training differently so you may remember that I said our training was delivered over two, three days where we had longer sessions and breaks uh, with the befrienders. But for Zoom delivery, we uh, split it into five sessions of about 45 minutes um, each. And uh, that's what people had on, on, on different days. Um, in terms of the intervention, so each pair uh, had, um, they were matched as a pair and then they had four to five befriending sessions. And in all the sessions, the, one researcher was um, present as a silent participant. Their um, camera was off and their mic was muted. They only introduced themselves in the beginning and then they muted uh, themselves. Um, and um, our befrienders also attended four group supervision sessions. And again, they had the option to um, contact the supervisor if they needed anything uh, more. In terms of what we're looking at, uh, we're looking at whether people completed the sessions as intended, so the training sessions, the supervision sessions, and the befriending visits. And our befrienders, uh, sorry, our researchers are making observations. So during their, um, they're observing the visits, they uh, rate uh, the fidelity against the fidelity checklists of the trial. Uh, they're also there to help with um, technical issues. And we also rate the fidelity of the supervision and the training. And then uh, we're planning to run a focus group with the befrienders to get their views on the whole scheme uh, and one-to-one um, -one interviews with the befrienders. So what have we found so far? Yes, there are challenges. Um, first of all, our researchers organized all the sessions. Um, uh, tech problems uh, emerge, not just at the beginning. Uh, we had a pair that have been experiencing tech problems throughout due to poor Wi-Fi and other uh, problems. And also we have the typical Zoom communication problems that I'm sure we've all encountered. For example, in group supervision sessions, turn taking may be harder than in a face-to-face -face, um, session. But there are a lot of positive uh, reflections. Fidelity uh, is high. Um, it seems that what happens in the online version is very similar to what happens in the, in the live version. The intervention is, is true to, to what it's meant to be. People make positive reflections. The people with aphasia during the sessions uh, comment. Um, they comment on what a blessing this is at a time like this, that they can sit in the comfort of their own living room and connect with somebody. But they also have commented of how useful this may be for people with more severe aphasia or more severe um, uh, physical problems that they can't get out of the house or they're afraid to get out of the house. Um, our people with aphasia have been very resourceful. They have surprised us. They took responsibility, um, in the vast majority, they took responsibility for solving the tech problems. Our researchers had to intervene less than they thought they would have to. And our researchers also observed that it seems the whole thing is lower burden for the befriender especially at the start of befriending. Um, you know, our befriender normally would have to find where the person lives, um, decide how they're going to get there, make sure they get there in time, uh, manage their fatigue, you know, they had to travel, carry out a visit and go back home safely. And this doesn't happen in, in, um, in online peer befriending. Um, it, it, they seemed more uh, comfortable uh, at their own homes and interacting from, um, from, your own home with another also made a difference. They weren't guests to somebody's home. Uh, both the befriender and the befriendee were relaxed in their own environment. There was a lot of laughter um, in the sessions. Um, people used the environment to stimulate conversation. They would talk about something that's in the background or um, they would take the camera and go and point what's, what's outside the window and talk about it. So, in summary, Overall, we had positive um, outcomes. Our study procedures were feasible and acceptable to the participants. So we've taken a lot of lessons forward in terms of what we should do um, in a definitive trial, but we do know that a lot of the things we did worked well and we can um, replicate them. The intervention was feasible and acceptable to the participants. And we also have, um, surprisingly and encouragingly, we have uh, positive um, evidence of uh, uh, a benefit to the to the different days of receiving the intervention. So this is preliminary, as this is a feasibility trial, but uh, the, the, there was preliminary evidence of positive change in terms of depression in clinical outcomes and very positive reflections in our qualitative data.
We do need to monitor the well-being of the befrienders throughout the trial and make sure that uh, any befriending scheme makes to make sure that um, the, the befrienders are well supported to deliver the intervention and they had somebody to contact if they need to. But overall, the good news is that we can progress a full trial. And in terms of, of um, clinical implications, you know, um, peer befriending seems to be a very promising scheme for people with aphasia. Um, I want to highlight a website uh, that we've developed at CPCP Access Resources for Aphasia, where we make um, uh, our therapy resources, uh, our assessment tools, and any products we develop at CP available for, for others. Um, so, um, uh, our resources from Superb will be shared on the City Access uh, website. And thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Katerina. Um, thank you for, for such a beautiful and clear and engaging presentation on such an important um, area of research. Um, it was just lovely. Um, we've got some wonderful questions that have come through on Slido, if you're happy to talk through these. Um, Robin O'Halloran says, thank you, Katarina, what a wonderful study. Can you talk about what makes a good befriender? Yeah, so um, what we did, obviously, I showed you the sort of the eligibility criteria for the befrienders. So they had to be longer down the line, more than one year in our study, um, and they had to have um, uh, moderate uh, to mild aphasia. In fact, we did have befrienders that had a more severe aphasia than the befriendees. So this was not um, um, uh, a deciding factor, but they had to be good communicators and willing to communicate. And during the development phase of the study, we had a, a long development phase, six months, uh, and we had multiple uh, meetings with our consultants with aphasia. And they told us what they think. They were all, all our consultants were people who had been befrienders and were befrienders at Aphasia Reconnect. So we discussed what makes a good befriender and they sort of um, gave some criteria which we then passed on to the um, to um, to our recruiting teams so they, they talked about um, uh, the befriender being somebody who is um, well adjusted uh, adjusted uh, in themselves they may have had difficulties they have faced different things but they've reached a point where they feel um, well adjusted and they're keen to help others this was also very very um, important um, so these are the main things, people that are willing to help others, that they want to make a difference. Um, and they're good communicators, despite the, 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 you know, the, the severity of their aphasia, they're willing to, to communicate and, and with others. Yes. Um, I think these are the key things. So um, yeah, and and our clinical. Um, so we had speech and language therapists or leaders in community groups that nominated befrienders, which we then screened um, in the study. So you know, we all I think know, and perhaps a lot of you are now thinking, I know this person that would make uh, a good befriender. Yes, lovely. Thank you. Did you find participants characterise their relationships as friendships after six sessions? Um, and there's two parts to this. Would more regular sessions be preferable or possible? And did any of the befriending pairs maintain their connections after the intervention? Yeah. So uh, there are two aspects to this, I think. I, I think you can deliver a befriending scheme in whatever way you want. Uh, and certainly support services and aphasia reconnect uh, delivers befriending. The befrienders decide on the frequency of the visits. They do whatever they feel right for them. And a lot of them befriend for years. But we were looking at peer befriending as an intervention that we can deliver in our health services and we can promote sort of, you know, the NHS here in the UK or, you know, um, services to, to take it up and, and include it as a service for their clients with aphasia. So in that light, it has to be a defined uh, intervention. So we wanted to, to choose something that would be um, cost effective and feasible as, a, as an intervention uh, for a service to provide. This is why we went for about six sessions. Again, this was informed of what our consultants with aphasia said. Um, and uh, the frequency of the meetings um, was a little more often than uh, once a month. So again, it was frequent. Um, some, for the purpose of the trial, the befriending had to stop as any intervention has to stop. Uh, but, um, 
the different these and the different they both talked about you know it would be nice to see this person again and indeed somebody sort of went then to the same support group they went to the same you know the befriend they helped the befriend to get a, to, to a support group where they would meet so uh, you know the end is is it depends again on what the the provision is mm -hmm. thank you um notable it was notable that the majority of both significant others and befrienders were female did you notice gender differences in the outcome measures or feedback from these groups? Yeah, um, well, it's it's hard because for the befrienders we had 10 um, women and two men, so you can't really compare them and conclude anything. Mm. Uh, we did notice it ourselves. Um, for the significant others is probably um, not surprising uh, given the demographics of um, of stroke but you know it is surprising though but actually i'm saying this but actually we did have a lot of women uh, as participants in our study but it was a daughter uh, a granddaughter that was there the significant other so we don't know why this has happened we don't know whether this um, means anything mm -hmm. but i don't think i can say anything about differences in outcome measure because we have very small groups so you know we can't really say very much um yeah. there that's understandable are you able to evaluate how the challenges faced by befrienders um impacted on adherence to the principles of peer befriending um and how did the research team support befrienders to tailor the sessions to the befriendees needs and preferences yeah so that's um that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know whether uh, the challenges faced by befrienders uh, impacted uh, on adherence. Generally, our adherence was uh, good. Obviously, um, there were a couple of matches that we would say that failed. Uh, not all the matches were fantastic and brilliant. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, if a befriender shows up and there's nobody there, you know, it will be one of those that two sessions were completed rather than six, you know, this is, you oh, know, yeah. this, uh, yeah, is exactly what happens. But supervision was very important uh, and supervision was very flexible. So, you know, for some befrienders, the supervisor will undertake to arrange the visits. Uh, the supervisor might help ring before and make sure the person is there. So this was, this was um, personalized, you know, some people managed to do this themselves. Some people needed more support. Um, and Nick is, has just added something to the chat saying that um, we have more more information about all of these on the tidier um, checklist on the paper that I've talked about. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, are you OK to take a couple more, Katerina? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Did you course. ask? Uh, did you ask if the person with aphasia would consider becoming befrienders after the end of the trial? I don't think that we, um, I don't think that we asked that. I'll have to go back to the uh, qualitative interviews to see whether anything came up there, but we didn't, we didn't officially um, ask that. But, you know, we, we have, um, we, you know, we ask our participants whether they are okay for us to contact them after the trial. And for those that have said yes, we can certainly uh, follow up and certainly go to a larger trial. We can talk with the local services. We can talk to the people we know now because we know a lot more people and see whether they want to have any further involvement in a scheme like this. But also the befrienders, just to say that the befrienders that we have trained are a local resource now in their in the boroughs and their communities um, because they can continue to befriend and, you know, the, the SLT services know about them. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sam Harvey um, just comments, this work is so relevant, so much work to screen and recruit approximately 10% of people with a aphasia identified. Is there any way to take trials like this beyond national boundaries, potential to pull populations for trials of this type? Yes, absolutely there is. And this is something that Miranda, uh, myself and other people are, are actually very actively thinking about. And, and um, you know, we do need to do this. Um, aphasia is a small population and, and we need uh, international trials that maximise the sample size that we have. Um, yeah, and we need to be doing this and we are on the case. Lovely. And Miranda said, thanks for a great talk. Um, you've covered this a little bit already about the end of befriending time and transition to the scheme. Yeah. 
So this is, uh, thank you, Miranda, that's a really good question because this is one of the little disappointments that I have about the, uh, the whole scheme. We actually thought a lot about the end of befriending and we consulted with our um, consultants with aphasia and we offered these two optional visits, which were not uh, great in terms of the dose of intervention, but we were determined to offer them as optional visits um, if people needed them for a smooth transition to the end of befriending. Because a lot of people said, oh, you know, it's hard when it finishes, you want to, to make it more manageable. But actually the ends were identified as a problem in our scheme, despite all the sort of thought we put into it and despite um, how we try to address it. Um, there were occasions that people weren't uh, prepared for the end or they thought it came all of a sudden that they didn't realize you know, that that would be the last visit and we weren't sure why this happened, whether the befriender didn't communicate properly uh, or whether there was a communication breakdown. Um, but it came, you know, endings came up as difficult by both um, the befriendees and the befrienders still. So we are looking into this and we are looking in a qualitative data to see what we need to do um, differently. Uh, and perhaps we need more training on managing endings and revisiting endings more frequently in the supervision, though they did come up in the supervision more frequently and more. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I'm conscious of the time, um, but are you able to um, let us know what the average time was from the end of formal speech therapy to befriending? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't um, long because when we were very uh, sort of actively waiting for one the, when the therapies finish, it may be that speech therapy finished, but then there was uh, OT and physical, physio or something else. So we wanted active supports to, to be uh, withdrawn. Generally, it would be about um, a couple of weeks. It wasn't that long. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katerina, for just a wonderful presentation. And, um, you know, we're so thrilled to have you present today. So thanks so much. Um, and we welcome everyone. We thank everyone for participating today and welcome you to add any suggestions about future topics to the poll on Slido. Our next seminar will be provided by Associate Professor Teppo Sarkamo um, from the University of Helsinki and he's going to talk to us about preservation of singing skills and rehabilitative efficacy of music in stroke and aphasia. So thank you once again, and we'll see you next month. Bye.